is how to be a great developer. Uh, if you're in the wrong talk, you should leave now. <laughs> um, and my name is Ed Finkler. Uh, I am the uh, head of developer culture at a company called Graph Story. If you're real curious, this is not about Graph Story, but uh, it's about kind of developer culture y stuff. Um, there's some contact info there if you want to talk to me. Um, but the assertion that I'm going to make basically is that, the first one, is that tech skills are really overrated as developers. So it's not that they don't matter. There's a level of competency that you want to be at so that you can do certain kinds of things. Um, I think there's always things that we want to learn. There's always things we want to do better. And I've been doing this for 20 years, and I haven't found a point where I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I should probably stop. Um, so it's not that they don't matter, but it's that they're really, really overrated, I, in my estimation. Um, uh, in fact, I'd argue that the things I talk about here are more important than tech skills, uh, that these things are more important in terms of being productive, being effective, being a well-liked and effective person in the things that you're trying to do. Um, and I've seen a lot of very technically accomplished folks who were, in my estimation, really actually poor developers because they didn't practice the kinds of things that I'm going to talk about in here. Um, and so let's talk about what those things are. So really, I have five sort of major principles that make a great developer. Um, and the first one, and we'll go over each one of these in some detail, but they always tell you, Tell them what they're going to learn. Tell learn first, and that's what I'm going to do. It's, you know, anyway, yeah. Um, so you practice empathy, practicing humility, always be learning, kind of like uh, Glengarry Glen Ross. Uh, always be learning. Uh, avoid tribalism, and better your community. And those are the five things I'm going to focus on here. Um, and we'll go through this. We'll go. Th there's probably a lot of stuff to talk about. This is pretty high-level stuff. So then, it, hopefully, I can finish up pretty shortly and have a, have some discussion about that stuff. So, we're talking about practicing empathy. Um, I think it's important to understand what empathy is. I think there's a lot of times it gets mixed up with sympathy, which is not the same thing. So to help out is empathy is the ability to understand how a person feels and why they feel that way. Uh, it doesn't mean endorsing what they do. It doesn't mean saying that what they did was okay. It means understanding how they feel and why they did certain things. Um, so it's not feeling sorry for somebody. <laughs> that is not what it means. Um, and I really strongly feel that empathy is the most important skill you can practice. I think it applies as much as being, in, being a developer as in lots of other things that you do in your life, and maybe everything you do in your life, but I feel really strongly about that. Um, I think it's important to practice it with everyone you interact with and everyone who interacts with your work. Because typically, when we're developers, uh, we are not just making things that ephemerally disappear into the ether, but they are actually used by people to do things. And uh, it's important that we have empathy for the people who interact with our work. Um, so um, there's a, a couple things that, to get across there. And one of the things I talk about is, is, is in part, part of that practicing empathy is never assume you know why a decision was made unless you were in the room when it was made. I see this mistake made a lot by developers. Uh, I think there's a tendency to, I think particularly when it's something that we didn't make or it's something that we forgot we made, um, which I do a lot, uh, I'll say, why the hell did this person do that? Or why was this decision made? And typically, what I found is there was always some kind of logic and compromise behind it, and there was at least a reason why it was done. Now, looking back at it, if you do a post-mortem on something like that, you may used to say, well, maybe that wasn't the best way to do those kinds of things. But at the time, it seemed like a good idea. And there probably was a decision-making process, whether effective or ineffective. There was a process that was gone through to get where you're trying to go. Um, the other thing I think to go along with, um, with that is always to keep two groups in mind as a developer. And there's really two that I think matter the most, and those are the ones you really want to think about all the time. The first one are your users, and I emphasize them first because I think it's really important. I think we typically don't emphasize people who are using the things that we make, but I think those are the people that we need to think about the most in order to uh, 
in order to serve their needs because that's probably why we're making most of the stuff that we do. We're trying to empower people to do things. And, um, and then the rest of your team, the other people who interact with your code, with the work that you've, you've made, interact with it directly. Um, they're the ones that are most affected by the decisions that you make and the things that you choose to do. Um, so a couple other points along that lines. Um, one of the things I've seen when we're talking about teams, is, excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink of water. Um, well, okay, well, let me talk about users first for a second. Solving the user's problem is really what most developers do. Now there's going to be some cases where as a developer that's not really what you do, I guess. But generally there are users of the things that you make and you're trying to solve problems for them. And that problem is I can't, oftentimes is I can't do X, I want to do X, or I can't do X as effectively as I want to do it, so I want to do it more effectively. And technology used as what you call a force multiplier. Um, so solving the user's problem should be your focus and not solving your problems. Now, if to solve your problems, you can more effectively solve the user's problems, that is awesome. That is exactly, and every, the world is in synchronicity and everything is good. But typically, the point of, a, of a, you know, something, again, is to not solve your problems necessarily. It, it is to solve the user's problems. So anything that makes your job easier, but makes the user's job not necessarily as easy, is I would say not a good practice in terms of being a developer. Um, I think understanding and empathizing with the user is what allows you to solve their problem. By thinking about what is it the problem they're trying to solve? What are, you know, what is it like to be this user who interacts with this product? I think that there's a common thing that I think, one of the things that you'll see a lot, I think with developers, because most developers use computers, that's been my experience, um, is that uh, you, and you use computers all the time. And you understand, let's, a good example of this is, you probably understand how a file system works on a basic level of there are folders and there are files and you navigate up and down these hierarchical lists of folders and jump in and out of them and stuff gets stuck in there and not stuck in there. And you understand how to look around, you probably understand how to search for things, you understand how to look at all that stuff. All that's very important. The average person who is using a computer, which is to say the vast, vast, vast majority of people who use computers and interact with computers, even on a daily basis, do not understand how that works. So when you tell them, download this file and run it, there's a good chance it's gonna get fucked up somewhere in there. And there are only two steps, download, run. And the thing is, there's a whole lot of complexity an assumption of understanding that happens in that, thing, that process. A whole lot of, in, in, in making those two statements. How, what does it mean to download something? Okay, so I have an idea that I'm taking, a, I'm transferring a file and this ends up somewhere on my computer. How do I know where it goes? I don't know. Every single time I interact with somebody who is not a person who has to deal with sort of the guts of their computer, inner workings of their operating system, Every time I try to tell, I say, oh, well, you could download this thing and do that. It, does, it is humbling how complex it is and how much stuff we take for granted. There's a thing that we often say is, well, something is intuitive or not intuitive. Things are only intuitive or not intuitive, or at least the majority of things are only intuitive or not intuitive because we happen to be used to them. And there was a process we went through to get used to them that we maybe aren't consciously aware of or we forgot we went through it. Um, I remember when I was seeing my son trying to interact with a keyboard and a mouse. Um, and if anyone tells you that a keyboard and mouse interface is intuitive, that is horse shit. It is not intuitive. There's no way it's intuitive. To somebody who has never used it before, well, to somebody who uses it all the time, of course it's intuitive, of course it makes sense. But it doesn't make sense until you practice it a bunch. Then you sort of start to get it. Then it becomes an extension of your hand and da, 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 da. There's a reason why touch interfaces, well done, simplified touch interfaces, tend to be more intuitive when you see those videos of kids who are like, you know, a year and a half old and somehow they're interacting with a tablet and stuff like that. Well, the reason why is because human beings are, can understand that 
they have an intuitive, they do have an intuitive sense of what's their body and I can use my body to interact with things. But they don't have an understanding of this abstraction where it's like, well, if I interact with this thing, somehow magic happens over here and those things are directly connected. And we don't know that until that actually, we, get, we learn those things. So that's part of that empathy process. And so you have to think about who your users are and what they do. And it doesn't mean, I, I hear this all the time where people talk about, oh, here's this list of stupid things that people said about computers. Well, that is so, oh, that drives me nuts. It's exactly the same kind of thing that I'm sure every auto mechanic who's ever listened to me talk about what's wrong with my car when I bring it in has said about me. Because I don't have some you know, complex understanding of how cars work. I just don't because I never learned that. And I did learn how this crap works, sort of. So, um, you know, it's only, you know, things only seem dumb to somebody because they learned what, how it's supposed to work. And, and, you know, there's no, but we're exactly the same person in a bunch of other fields that we don't have specialized knowledge in. We happen to have very specialized knowledge in a very specific field. And it happens to be one that I think the great thing about this, it happens to be one where we can use it to empower lots of people to do things they couldn't do otherwise. And that's what's really awesome about being a developer, I think. But I think it's important to think about the people who use our stuff are not necessarily us. And we have to think and empathize with them. We have to think of what it's like to be them and what, what they think about and how they interact with stuff. The other thing I was gonna say about, about the team, the people you interact with, is that I think poor communication, and there, this is a complex topic about how you do effective communication, particularly if you do remote work or things like that. I've been working remotely for five or six years. Um, but poor communication will kill the effectiveness of the most talented team. If you don't have that stuff working inside your team, if you're not interacting well with the folks who you work with and who you're, you're, you're collaborating with, it's not gonna work. So it's really important to work hard at effective, structured communication and documentation. One of the things I learned is that when you work remotely, you have to be a lot less lazy about that stuff. It is really easy to be lazy and do a bunch of um, sort of, what should I say, uh, things that kind of work, you can get away with and cut a lot of corners when you have people all in the same place. Um, and you can't cut those corners when you are interacting with people remotely and you're trying to get stuff done remotely. It, it sort of, it, it forces you to be a lot more disciplined in it, I think. The second thing is practicing humility. And I think humility really goes hand in hand with empathy. Now I will say that this audience is different than the audience where I give this talk almost every place else. Because folks here I think have, I, my experience has been that people are a little more self-aware and there's a little more humility that goes into this stuff and there's more practice of empathy and things like that. But I think we can all have run into folks who seem, who feel like they have a really, really strong understanding of something. Um, and not just something, but just sort of in general. And I, I really feel strongly that you have to know that you're always going to be learning and improving. And you have to accept and own up to your mistakes immediately. Be open to the likelihood that you're wrong about a great many things. You are probably wrong about a lot of stuff you think right now is correct. I know I'm wrong about a lot of stuff that I will learn down the road that I said, oh boy, that wasn't very smart. And I think 10 years ago there was stuff that I thought was very important and I was very passionate about and doesn't seem like it really matters that much anymore. Um, you're wrong about a lot of stuff. You know very little about most things. Like I talked about, we have very specialized knowledge in a certain field or a certain set of fields. But for the most part, we don't have knowledge about a lot of other things. And everyone else is exactly the same way. Everyone else, that is the way human beings work. That is how limited they are. And it's important to embrace that and understand that and always learn and always question what you think you know and always adapt and always grow because you're always gonna be learning stuff. And I think it's really important that you allow others to practice that humility too. 
Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, after this. Um, but the less that you fear being wrong, the more confident you can be. And it's important that you are in environments that allow you to do that. So it is important that you allow other people to be wrong and to, be, to practice that humility and to make those mistakes and not to punish them for it, but to be understanding about that. Um, and I think a final point about that is understand what you do do well, do do, uh, it is important that you understand what you do well and what you don't and have some knowledge of that. That's part of self-examination and that's part of saying, of having, this is a hard thing for me to practice, is having enough confidence to say, I, yes, I am actually good at this. I'm good at this thing. And there are some other things that I'm not good at, but I am good at some things. And in a humble way, being confident in that and feeling like I am capable. Um, so that is something that's really key, I think, too, is understanding what you do well and what you don't. And therefore, I think that helps you build teams, too. I think it helps you know when to say, hey, I need help with this aspect. Um, I need a person who really has these kinds of skills. I need help from this person who's, in my t who's on my team who has a better understanding of this. Let me go ask them. I have spent so much time, <laughs> I've wasted so much time uh, not asking questions about stuff because I just wanted to push through on myself, uh, by myself and try to figure it out when it was much faster uh, to learn to just work with somebody and I gained that knowledge so much faster. There's a, a great talk that unfortunately got canceled. Uh, my friend uh, Yitz Wilroth was going to give a talk uh, to Ludic Maxims. Uh, I can't remember, Talmudic Maxims for the developer, I can't remember, it was, it was a, it's a much cooler title than I can remember. Somebody said it. it was, it's a great talk if you have a chance to see it. Why did it get canceled? Uh, because he was going to fly from Europe to here to Europe. He's trying to give this talk 50 times in a year. And, uh, but you should go to his website, Code Rabbi, uh, and he's just an amazing guy. And, but the, his talk is primarily about um, if I was to sum it up in one sentence is, don't try to learn everything yourself, work with other people to learn together, and you do it way, way faster. So, yeah. Always be learning, always be learning, always be learning. I think it's really important that you set aside a little time each week. And for me, as busy as I am, uh, I don't know, each month, <laughs> I might have an hour. Um, but set aside a little time, if you can, each week, just to learn about some new stuff. Uh, even if it's just, I, I kind of like subscribing to these weekly aggregation newsletters. There's like Python news and JavaScript news and PHP news and Ruby. And there's all this, there's a bunch of things like that. And I like those because it gives me this list of stuff that, well, oh, this might be interesting. I can go check it out. And I can say, oh, yeah, that does look kind of interesting. And I can file it away in my head and maybe I remember it when I actually have something to apply it to or maybe I see something I'm like, that is exactly what we need right now and I go grab it and check it out. And maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. But um, it gives me cool new things to explore. Um, uh, and if you go to conferences, and I think you should, like this one, try to catch, and this is a, a, a great conference because there's so much d diversity in the topic. It's so great. There's a lot of very tech-specific conferences. I love Open Source Bridge, and I like OzCon. Um, and so if you have an extra $2,000, try to catch that one. And, um, but it's so great because you have an opportunity to explore a lot of the things that you wouldn't normally. Like you say, oh, well, I primarily do this. So all you sort of knew, know is that ecosystem and that. I'm a Ruby developer, so all I know is Ruby, and I know different kinds of stuff. And I, but I really only know one ecosystem, and you sort of learn the the maxims and the values and the tenets and the practices of that group. Uh, and I think it's really eye-opening when you get to explore other ones. Um, and I think that's really cool. Uh, if you go to conferences that have talks that, oh, I hate this word, soft talks. This is probably a soft talk. Um, I, I go to those because there's a lot of conferences that have very few or none of them. Uh, it also helps to see that people actually go to those. Please, because I'm pretty much only giving soft talks now. Um, so try to catch one or two talks about technologies or other topics that you really don't have a lot of experience with. And sometimes you're going to be like, yeah, I, I don't care about this, right? And sometimes you're going to be like, oh, that's actually pretty cool. And even if you, I think that you find that 
it, it sort of opens your mind to a little bit of different approaches that you hadn't thought about before. Um, so there's this maxim that I have written is be liberal in learning about new technologies and approaches and be conservative about using them. So it's very, it's, you really want to learn about stuff that's going on if you have time. I think it's really helpful. It gives you lots more things to kind of call, to call from and pull from and things like that. But you got to be really, really careful about jumping into sort of what I call fashion-driven development, which is, um, oh god, um, I hate to pick on anybody, but this happens a lot in JavaScript, um, in that community, in that community where there, things are very fast-paced and it seems like things turn over very, very fast. And as the community matures, they realize that maybe there's some things that they did very fast that didn't work out. And as I am, I primarily come out of an older language and community and we kind of sometimes sit back and say, oh, you guys, you, <laughs> you didn't think that you needed to namespace your package management stuff so that <laughs> there, you wouldn't have name collisions. That's very funny. That's very <laughs> funny. Um, because, yes, surprisingly, people name stuff the same. I saw, did I see a, I think I saw a JavaScript library called curl, C-U-R-L. It's like a <laughs> Google system. <laughs> I don't know, and I see that a lot. I see stuff like that a lot. Um, and I, I, again, I'm not just trying to pick up JavaScript. It happens, it happens everywhere. It's, there's a lot of stuff that's really exciting, it's really cool, and you want to build something with it. Do not build something that if it falls apart and fails dramatically, it's going to hurt anybody. And hurt anybody or cause damage to the company or, you know, God forbid, you know, interfere with their livelihood or things like that. So you've got to be really careful about that stuff. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, oh, everything, you just don't trust anybody under 35, I guess. Um, don't trust any, anything that is very new. But kind of don't trust anything that's really new because there's a reason why things stick around and get used for a long time. And typically it's not just because uh, people are kind of pack animals and do the same stuff over and over. It's not just because of that. It's because also they work. And they've been tested in lots of different environments and they continue to get used because they're effective. So it's cool to like do exploratory work, but be really, really sure about what you're gonna do before you actually put it into say a production thing where it might actually really impact people and impact say the stuff your users, impact your other developers, that kind of thing. Um, Another thing I think it's important to, uh, that goes along with sort of obvious learning and these kind of technology choices we make is that any technology can be the right choice depending on the project and the strength of the team. So, okay, so I have a whole lot of knowledge about PHP uh, because I've been doing that like 16, 17 years. I have pretty good knowledge of JavaScript, but not as much as a lot of people because I haven't done much of it for the past couple of years. And I have some knowledge of Python. I've done some Python web development. I'm okay at it. Um, so I started this job at Graph Story, and I'm also the lead developer there. I was the first employee hired. That was very exciting. First developer employee hired. And within three weeks, they had me doing Java development. Um, now, I hadn't written any Java in probably 12 or 13 years, except for a couple. Does anybody here remember when? Um, when uh, OS 10, the Apple's OS 10, you used to be able to write Java um, uh, apps, like native Java apps, because they, all, they supported both Java and Objective-C as languages that interacted with their frameworks. Well, they killed that off like in 10.2, I think. Um, well, I, I started using it in 10.1, and uh, I messed around with it a little bit because Java is more, was more comfortable to me than Objective-C, which I still think looks like scribbles. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's but, uh, you know, that was the last time I'd messed with it. So we're talking like, you know, early 2000s maybe. Uh, and, but the thing is that in that case, for what we were trying to do, which was to basically add on extensions to the Neo4j graph database, which is written in Java, 
Java was absolutely the right choice for that. And it was close enough to stuff I've done that I could figure it out. The hard, and by the way, the hardest thing was not the language. And I find this consistently. The language is not the problem, and that's not what's hard to learn. It's all the tooling around it. And Java is sick with tooling. It is crazy tooling, and there are all the documents say, well, you already know how to do this, so just do that. And that's like the, how you summarize every piece of documentation about any Java tool. Um, you're already a good developer in Java. Um, and then every JVM language. You've already written years of Java. <laughs> um, but it, it, so it was absolutely the right tool for it because doing anything else would have been far more complex and prone to failure. It was so much easier to do what we wanted to do in Java because there's an, ex, an, a, an extension system for Neo4j that uses Java. And we could have used some other JVM language like Scala or something like that. And the amount, but the amount of documentation and people doing stuff in Java for that kind of stuff was like that tall. And the amount of people doing stuff for Scala was like that tall. And then everything else was like, there might have been a person who once wrote a blog post. <laughs> once. And that was the best you could do. That was it. And I'm like, look, I really don't know how to do any of this stuff. So I'm going to go to the place where there's lots of documentation and there's lots of people. And there's probably a better chance I'm going to be able to figure that out from this than from this. So, and, you know, again, Java was close enough syntactically and stuff like that that there weren't a lot of new concepts to learn from it. Um, so that was the right choice. It wasn't a great choice, but it was the best choice we had, and that's a good example of that. Um, I, and I think it's a real a mistake that I see a lot of people go in and they say, okay, well, I know that everybody here is a Rails developer, but we're going to do everything in, I, shit, I don't know, Swing or something like that. Not Swing, Jesus. Um, <laughs> whatever <laughs> name Java. NetBeans. Yeah, let's say NetBeans. Um, Good God. Beans, I still don't know what the fuck a bean is. Um, anyway, the point is, but you don't go in there and say, okay, we're all gonna learn this. That is so much work to get every, you're gonna have to train everybody to do this. Well, what are the strengths of your team? And what is the thing you're trying to do? And what's the knowledge base look like? And what's the community look like? Those questions all come into that. And if you're not thinking about all those things, you can make a really bad mistake doing that. I've turned down tons and tons of technologies, even though it was a really good, looked like technologically it was a really good choice, but because the documentation and the community around it was small or non-existent. Now, some other people feel more comfortable with that. I just don't. That's not my thing. I really need a lot of documentation to figure out how stuff works, and I need a lot of people around it. So I don't choose stuff that typically ha has a very small community around it, or looks like it's very transitional. I swore off of using AngularJS, not because of where it is right now, but because I looked at what they were going to do with the 2.0 version, and I said, I think that this is either going to, they're going to abandon 1.0, so I don't want to write anything in it, or this is going to fall apart completely, because I've seen that happen on a lot of projects. Um, and also, they kept breaking backwards compatibility with like minor version changes, and I said, that is not a project that I want to participate in after it's gone 1.0, and they're still doing that. Um, so that's, I just said, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, bet my future or my livelihood uh, with a company based on that. It's just a bad move. It doesn't mean that you should toss it out. Maybe it's good for you. It's just, it just wasn't what I would do. Um, so avoiding tribalism is really, really important. Boy, I've been talking a lot. Sorry about that. So we're social animals, and being a part of a group gives us confidence. That's part of being a human being. That's why we do that. But worrying over technology choices distracts us from doing good work and practicing empathy and things like that. Um, so it's really important to refuse to participate in tribalism. Um, we want to build communities with what we have in common and embrace the diversity that makes each of us unique. Make them, make, and we want to make those communities safe places for anyone who's interested in participating. Um, I think that the choices of technology and technique 
I think those things matter to some extent, but only so far as they serve what you're going to make with them, and otherwise they don't, other, they just don't matter otherwise. Um, I got a lot of good-natured ribbing about the fact that I was doing Java development uh, from people who were friends of mine, uh, because it certainly would have been my choice, and there's a lot of uh, jokes about that, and it was all good-natured, you know, blah, 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 blah. But at the same time, realistically, that was the right choice, and it mattered because I was making something and allowed me to make it more quickly and more effectively than another thing would have been. So in that way, it allowed me to serve the users of the thing that I was making more effectively. And that's why it mattered, and it didn't matter in any other way. It did not matter in any philosophical way. It did not matter in any moral way. It did not matter in any other respect. Um, I, so I, I, an analogy of that is as a musician, I'm not a very good one, but I've done a lot of, um, I have done some stuff, especially with electronic stuff. And um, I remember before you could just do everything on your laptop, you bought these big racks of synthesizers and samplers and junk like that. So I ran into, as a musician, I ran into tons and tons of people who had great gear and they had like a pretty decent job and they were, were maybe single or they didn't have a lot, they had a lot of disposable income and they would spend tons of money and they had like $20,000 worth of gear in their apartment and stuff like that. And they love to argue about equipment. They love to argue about techniques and this and that, but they barely ever finished a song. <laughs> I swear, I saw that again and again and again. And the point is the song, it's not how you make it, really. It kind of matters, and just the appreciation you have for people who are clearly very skilled at those techniques. But, for mo but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter that much. The end result is what matters, and the end result is this thing that you make that say, as a developer, that empowers people to do things that otherwise they would be less capable or not capable of doing. Um, and one thing I say really strongly is that you should view absolute statements with extreme skepticism. I hear people saying things all the time about how amazing stuff is or how just terrible something is and this is just garbage or this is so great. And anytime anybody uses stuff like that, it gets in this hyperbole thing or it says it must or it has to be or you've got to use this or it's crap or things like that. I just, I'm very, very skeptical of it because to me that doesn't sound like somebody who's being careful and measured about how they're, what they're thinking about and why they're doing the things that they're doing. It sounds like they're getting tribal. It sounds like they're getting, they're sort of setting up us versus them situations. And it's very, very easy to do that. And it's very, very tempting to do that. We do that in so many different ways. Um, not just this. Also about things that sort of matter too, not just stupid stuff like programming languages. But it's really, really dangerous to do that too. Um, and it makes it very, very hard to have diverse communities of thought and experience. Um, one of the things I find is that dismissing a technology with a sound, without a sound, reasonable argument is lazy and prone to error. That happens a lot, thanks. Um, and I think you have to be really, really careful about participating in sort of X versus Y arguments, like, I don't know, Rails versus, something else, Django or whatever, all, all those kinds of things. I just don't think it really matters. At the end of the day, it's so much more complex. I just don't think it really matters. Um, and I think really importantly, I think you reserve your loyalty for people and not for brands and not for companies and not for technologies because those things don't really matter. None of those things matter. They try to trick you into thinking it matters. And there's some technologies and technology stacks that people are good at marketing to you and they get loyal about it and they get wrapped up about it and they want you to be, what they want you to do is to be part of your tribe in some artificial construct around something that really just doesn't matter. But the only thing that matters really is how we're interacting with people. So bettering your community. Um, it's really about making people's lives better with your skills and making the community around you better. I really feel strongly that you do not need to go to some magic city of tech genius to do important work and to do work that impacts people and is valuable and is fulfilling. I think it really doesn't matter how many people use what you make, but if you can empower five people to do something that they couldn't do before or took them a very long time to do, um, that's really, really special and each one of those people is going to remember what you did for them 
And that is really important. The th most satisfying things I've done have typically been things that only a few people ever interacted with, but I was able to directly interact with them and see the impact that it had. And it doesn't matter where you are, what matters is the difference you make in the people's lives around you. And this is the internet so the people around you could be on the other side of the world. Um, I think it's really important to share what you learn with the people around you and ask them to share what they've learned with you. I think that's part of that process of learning and growing together. Um, you find people, other people doing stuff like you and share it with them. And it can be talks, it can be blogging, it can be conversations you just happen to have with somebody who you know. Just, you know, things like that. And I find that that stuff is not only satisfying and makes me feel good, but it's actually extremely helpful career-wise and without intent. I, I, I know that my career has benefited a lot from that because I like doing that. And that has positioned me in a place where I, people wanted to keep talking to me about jobs and things like that. That's not really why I do it, but that has been a really cool aspect of it because it means I, you know, it's really nice to want people, to people to want to talk to you about a job as opposed to not. Uh, that is something that's I, I feel really lucky about. Um, now, one thing I'll say is, as it come up a few times, they say, "Well, but, but I'm a supervisor. I'm not, I'm not a developer. And what does it mean?" And you know, some people talk about, "Well, yeah, I want to practice humility, or I want to practice empathy, or things like that." But I'm in a position where maybe I'm scared to practice humility because I feel like if I look like I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going to get shit on for one reason or another. And I really feel strongly that, um, first off, values of a any kind of hierarchical organization distribute from the top down. Um, that just happens. That's the way things happen. And the people who are at the top of that hierarchy set what is valuable to that organization. Um, and it's really, really important that supervisors on all levels have to be consistent about adopting and applying these kinds of values. Um, basically, great developers need great organizations to support them, big or small. They need these organizations that have these same values. And managers, supervisors, whatever, need to be prepared to practice these things as well to allow people to be humble and make mistakes, to be empathetic and to ask other people to be empathetic. Um, and they need to practice these and they need to defend that practice as well. Um, and they need to deal with individuals who don't practice them and figure out how do we get them on the right track and how do we empower them to go into this place. It's really a lot easier to be angry or negative when somebody screws up and to get pissed off about it because you get scared. You get scared it's going to affect your livelihood or somebody else's or it's going to be embarrassing or things like that. But it's really important that you practice, practice, practice empathy and that you, in, and, and, and that you with policies and sort of the way you do procedures, whether it has to be formal or informal, what have you, it doesn't need to be a lot of bureaucracy, but that you practice, you, th those values are set up that you practice, uh, you practice those values and you you have the, the organization based around those values to keep people moving in that right direction. So that's the end of this. There's a Q&A that we can do now. That's my uh, contact info. The font that I used for this was down here because I'm very proud of the fact that it looks like Commodore 64. I spent a lot of time on this, more, probably more than the talk. Um, but <laughs> how much time do we have? Like yeah, OK, so we got a couple questions I could. Maybe ask if anybody has any. So I think that's all the time I've got. I'll just try to stick around here for a little bit. If you have any more questions, I'll be around. So thanks very much. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm.